Well, good evening and welcome to midweek Bible class here at Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene. Uh, great week to join us. We're going to be looking at Acts 13, which fits really well with the Easter story. And of course, this Sunday is Easter. I want to remind you that uh, you should attend church Easter Sunday. If you are local, then of course you're invited to attend here. We have a Good Friday service at 6 p.m. Uh, and that one will be in person only. And then we have our uh, Saturday evening service at 6 p.m. and our Sunday morning service at 10 a.m., the worship service. There is no uh, Sunday school or discipleship classes this week, but you can still get together early. We'll be hanging out and chatting and having a little snack. So we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to be here Sunday morning as well. Uh, take a minute and invite a friend because uh, Easter is one of those Sundays that uh, people expect an invitation to. I've already talked to some folks that told me that they've been invited. So uh, you definitely want to take a moment and invite a friend. One other thing, uh, last week we talked about uh, Bible study books and we have some of those in. Uh, I don't have one, I didn't grab one to show you, but it's uh, scripture on one side, notebook on the other side. They're, they're very good, um, uh, very easy to use and very inexpensive. They're about four or five bucks a piece. And so if that's something that you'd like to have either for Acts for the second half of Acts that we're working on or for Romans that's coming up really soon. We'll be in Romans in no time at all, probably before 2022. We'll be breaking into Romans. So uh, if you want a book for Romans, let me know and we'll get those ordered up. But tonight we're going to be in Acts. Before we do, let's stop and pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, I pray that, uh, that people will hear what you have to say and be affected uh, greatly affected by what you have to say. Lord, we know that uh, there are people who will be watching on the internet that we might never meet, but we pray, Lord, that we will meet them in heaven and that they'll hear from you and be affected by you tonight. Uh, and for those who have come tonight, Lord, we pray your extra special blessing. Amen. All right, Acts 13. Now, we started in Acts 13 a week ago. We're going to pick up where we left off in Acts 13, verse 30. Um, but I want you to know before we do that this particular week is probably one of your pastor's busiest weeks, regardless of what church you're involved in, what denomination that might be. Easter week is always an incredibly busy week for a pastor. And one of the reasons is because Easter week is a week that pastors think just a little bit more about the sermon that they'll present even if they're in the middle of a topical study or scripture chapter by chapter, verse by verse, like we do here, uh, Easter week is one of those things that we, that we put a little extra time in. And the reason is because Easter Sunday morning really is kind of the central point of our faith. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be Christians. We wouldn't come to church. We certainly wouldn't get together on Sunday if it wasn't for Easter Sunday morning. Uh, Easter Sunday morning is the... Uh, uh, it tells us about the event that validated everything about Christ, everything he claimed to be, everything he claimed to do, and, and the claims he made when he spoke. All of those things were validated on Easter Sunday morning, uh, including everything that he says about the future and that he says about our standing with God. All of it came together Easter Sunday morning. Also, Easter Sunday is considered uh, kind of the uh, Super Bowl service of the faith. It's the... Uh, Sunday morning where more people will attend church than any other time. Um, typically, on a, a typical Sunday morning in the United States, up to around 40% of the U.S. population at least says they attend church. On Easter Sunday, that's more like 60% of the U.S. population. Uh, this year, what with the pandemic and stuff, they're kind of expecting that to be more like 40%. But if you compare that to the average 17% that have been attending over the last few months, that's a significant boost. And it's not just that people come together on Easter Sunday morning. It's, it's the individual audience. It's the specific people that come on Easter. You have a lot of folks that are very faithful and very committed to Christ and very involved in the things of the faith. And they want to make sure that they're that they're here to celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday. It's a, it's a big deal to be able to celebrate. Uh, bigger than anybody's birthday party, uh, bigger than any anniversary celebration is Easter Sunday morning. But you have a, another part of the audience that is not typically in church. 
on Easter Sunday. And these ones, um, pastors pay special attention to, to make sure that the message that we share on Easter Sunday morning is one that um, is winsome and effective at, at telling the gospel message, at telling the people who come the specific message that Christ has come to set them free and to forgive them and to justify them and to give them new life and that these people can enter into a relationship with God. Now, the folks that come every week or that are very faithful, they love hearing that. And the new folks that don't come so often, they like hearing that as well. Um, sometimes it's convicting. Sometimes it's challenging. But it's always good to consider our relationship with God in Christ. And so, pastor's pens are flying big time this week. Everybody's got their commentaries open and Logos Bible software and Blue Letter Bible is, is working overtime this week as pastors try to figure out what the best thing they could present to especially those who will soon be new believers. What's the best thing they could present? I want you to know that that is a um, common and accepted practice among preachers, and it has been since the very beginning. We will read tonight about a sermon that Paul delivered that is incredibly, incredibly well-developed, one that he clearly thought about quite a bit before he delivered. It is the very first real speaking that we get from Paul. I mean, you have a couple little snippets of dialogue, but this is the first time in the history of the Bible movement that we get to hear from the Apostle Paul. And what he says is pretty fantastic. One of the reasons that I think it's fantastic is because it's so similar to another sermon that another Christian preacher delivered that's recorded in Acts. It's recorded in Acts chapter 7. It's the sermon of Stephen. You might remember that Stephen was called up by the Sanhedrin to explain the faith. To The, the word is to apologize, apologia. It doesn't mean to say I'm sorry for being a Christian. The word apologize means to give an explanation or a defense. So next time your mama says, you need to apologize for that, it doesn't mean say, oh, I'm so sorry. It means explain your actions. If you tell your mama that and she slaps you across the face, it's not my fault. Anyway, um, he was called to give an, an apologia, to give an, an apologetic statement. What is this thing you're talking about, about Jesus? And so he explained in Acts chapter 7 in the form of, of what we would refer to as a well-developed sermon. He went through the history of God in the Old Testament and is dealing with Israel and the rejection uh, of God by Israel and, and the rejection that led to the eventual rejection of the Messiah, but how Christ gave his life for them anyway, and that they had a choice here to either continue to reject him or to come to faith. You might remember that there was a young Sanhedrin member there listening to that that day whose name was Saul. You might remember that at the end of that sermon, Stephen was accused of blasphemy, speaking against the truth of God, and um, that there was a vote taken, and that this young Sanhedrin member cast his vote against Stephen, and it was determined that his crime was so heinous that he should be killed, and so Stephen was taken outside of the walls of the city, and rocks were thrown at him until he died. And in the middle of that, we find this young Sanhedrin member, Saul, um, while well, he was holding people's coats. Well, they did that. He was too dignified to throw rocks himself, but he was giving approval to the whole event. It's really encouraging to me that when we catch up with a man named Paul, who used to be Saul, that he's giving a sermon that's remarkably similar to the one that Stephen gave. That tells me he was paying attention. In Acts, uh, later in Acts, where uh, Paul is giving his own apologia to uh, Agrippa, when he gives that apologia to Herod Agrippa II, he uh, says that when Jesus first spoke to him, he said, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you pushing back against what you know is true? Well, where did he first hear what he knew was true? Well, he heard it from Stephen. And when Stephen spoke, it affected him. He remembered what Stephen said. To this point, which is between 10 and 15 years later, he still remembers how Stephen developed the argument, and he can't find a better way of developing the argument for Christianity than just copying, essentially, the outline that Stephen had given. That's really um, encouraging to me, 
Because I sit up here on this stool every Wednesday or stand up on this stage every Saturday or Sunday and moo like a cow for half an hour and beller and, and, and preach away. And I really wonder sometimes if anybody's actually listening. And I look at people looking down. I, I, listen, listen, quit trying to hide it. I know you're playing Farmville. I know this. It, it's, it's obvious. And I, I know you're on Instagram or Facebook because nobody looks at their crotch and smiles. You're, you're playing your phone. I, it's okay. I, I, I get it. And no, I, I know you're not looking at the Bible app. I'm not offended. But sometimes I wonder if I'm doing any good. And I see people nodding off, not paying attention. And I see other people look right at me with this blank expression on their face that tells me they're looking, but they're not home. And then I see some people look right at me. And at the end of the sermon, they come up and pick one of the finer and most unimportant points to argue with me. I remember using uh, an analogy one time about using a particular piece of wood for a fireplace mantle and having it explained to me after the sermon that I was doing that wrong, that I was using the wrong kind of wood and that I was putting it in the wrong kind of way. And it's like, that's all you got out of, I mean, I put eight hours into prep and Sometimes more, sometimes I can put 10 or 12 hours into prep and put myself on the line for half hour, 45 minutes, and all you got is I'm a bad woodworker? Well, I mean, it's the truth, but I wonder if I'm doing any good a lot of times. And then I see Saul here, who was so greatly affected by the sermon of Stephen that, quite frankly, he couldn't help but become a Christian. And not just any Christian, but really the most powerful Christian apologist that's ever existed. And the very first time he stands up to speak, to give an apology, the very first time he does, he repeats Stephen's outline. It was so effective to him that he had to share it with these guys. That's encouraging to me. And it keeps me going to know that sooner or later somebody's going to listen And it's going to make some impact. You know, that's exactly what God said would happen back in Isaiah 55. It's a great section, one that I really like. Isaiah 55. Starting in verse 6, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he's near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will freely forgive. Doesn't that sound like an altar call? Man, that sounds like, I just want to start singing just as I am right now. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And as my thoughts, then your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth, And making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty. But it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. That's why I I pray every week as I'm prepping and getting ready. Lord, it's not my words. I don't, the people don't need to hear my words. I mean, my children have been listening to them for years. It doesn't seem to be doing any good. They don't need to hear my words. They need to hear your words, Lord. My words often return to me void. I've been saying shut out the light for however many years, and I come home and they're still all on. My words often return to me void. His words never do. Just as the rain waters the earth and returns to the heavens and yet still accomplishes its task, so his word waters our hearts and makes us grow. So... uh, So we pray, Lord, let's hear your word tonight. So starting in Acts chapter 13. Now I want to show you something really interesting right off the bat. Acts chapter 13 verse 2 says, As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Skip over to verse 13. Paul and his companions... In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 13, verse 13, it says Paul and his companions. Now, 
What did we miss? Well, there in, in 4 through 12, we see the mission to Cyprus and the effectiveness of it and how Barnabas and Saul landed there in Cyprus and worked their way on the island from west to east and had a great ministry. And by the time we get done, we see that Paul and Barnabas we're leaving Cyprus. Now that's really important. It's a detail that Luke puts in that you don't want to miss. Luke is an amazing journalist and an incredible writer. And when he drops details like this, you got to see what they are. Now we talked about the difference between Saul and Paul last week. Saul that essentially means I'm your man and Paul that means little humble and not important. On that trip through Cyprus, Saul became Paul. He began to realize that he's not all that in a bag of chips. I think he already knew. I think his 10 years or so in Tarsus just learning to, to connect with the Lord had taught him that he ain't the man. He used to think he was when he was a Pharisee. He was the, he was the up and coming. He was the golden boy. But he began to realize that in the light of Christ, he just ain't nothing. He's just a humble little guy. He's just Paul. And also through that trip across Cyprus, I think that Paul and Barnabas both begin to realize who was really in the lead here. When they left, Barnabas was in charge. Barnabas was calling the shots. Barnabas was making the plans. That's why they went to Cyprus. It's Barnabas' home island. He knew his way around. He knew who to talk to. He's in charge. By the time they get to the end, it seems that they both realized that Saul, is, or Paul now, is the one that seems to have the connection with the Holy Spirit to know what to do next. He seems to be the one that the Holy Spirit is anointing with leadership. So when we get to Acts chapter 13, verse 13, it's Paul and his companions. Name order is very important to the Greek. To start with Paul means Paul's the guy in charge. And then to not list the other ones means really by this point in the trip, Paul was the headliner and the rest of them were supporting, supporting actors by the time we get to this point. And we're going to see from Acts 13, 13 on that pretty much the rest of the book of Acts and honestly pretty much the rest of the New Testament with a few specific uh, mentions of guys like Peter and John, pretty much the rest of the thing centers around Paul's activities and Paul's teaching. Now I say that because of something else in that verse. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia but John left them and went back to Jerusalem. You remember who John is. That's John Mark. This is 10 to 15 years after Jesus' resurrection. By this time, we know that the gospel according to Mark, what we would call the gospel according to Mark, already existed in some form. It seems that this young man, John Mark, who was maybe 12 when Jesus died and rose again, so now he's in his mid-20s, we know that for some time he had traveled with the apostle Peter. We know that Peter had been traveling the 10 years previous to this. We know that Peter had gone into churches or into communities that then had churches and told them the gospel story and the truth about Christ. And they said, hey, can you leave us some literature? You're leaving and we want to be able to recall these stories. Have you written these stories down? And we know that in that process, Peter said to John Mark, buddy, grab a pen. And John Mark began recording the teachings of the Apostle Peter when he talked about the stories in the life of Christ. And you can see the John Mark-isms and the Peter-isms all through his gospel. One of the things you see about his account is that it's really fast. Immediately, the, immediately is one of the biggest words in that entire, in that entire uh, writing by Mark. Immediately this happened, and then immediately that happened. Well, both Peter and John Mark are big on just making stuff happen. Come on, let's go. We don't have time for fooling around. I don't have time to explain it. Here's the story. You figure it out. That's Mark. He had already written that down. It was already in circulation by this time. We've actually found fragments that date back to this time, which tells us it was already in circulation. He was not a newbie. Some people read that and they say, well, John went back to Jerusalem and they say, oh, the poor little boy must have missed his mommy and he wanted to go home. Shoot, no, he is already in his mid-20s. He is a uh, virtually middle age for a man at that point. I mean, he is mid-career. Uh, in in today's uh, in today's economy, that would put him that would be like a guy in his mid to late forties as far as his status in community. He was not a newbie. He had already traveled in missionary work quite a bit with Peter, around Judea and even in Samaria. He had he had a wealth of knowledge about the life of Christ. Not only had he seen it himself, but he wrote it down. 
And yet he bailed on these guys when they got to the end of Cyprus and headed straight back to Jerusalem. I have a theory. You know that John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. I have a feeling, based on some things that come up later, that it was Barnabas who asked him to go on this trip. Hey, we're going to do this missionary trip. We know you traveled with Peter. Why don't you travel with us? Are you going, Barney? Oh, yeah, I'm in charge. All right, in that case, I'm going. All of a sudden, it's not about Barnabas anymore. It's about Paul. And the other thing is, if you read between the lines in some of this stuff, particularly a few chapters later where Paul and Barnabas are preparing for another missionary trip, and Barnabas says, let's bring John Mark, and Paul says, absolutely not. There seems to be a bit of a personality clash between John Mark and Paul the Apostle. Paul does not trust John Mark, and John Mark does not trust Paul. And so all of a sudden, Paul is in charge, and John Mark says, if that's going to be the way it's going to be, I'm out of here. I didn't sign up to serve that man. It's kind of sad. You see the eventual breakdown in this wonderful relationship between Barnabas and Saul because of the problem between John Mark and Paul. It's very sad. But you know, our God is the God of reconciliation, and that's why I bring this whole thing up. That's why I spend all our time on Wednesday talking about that when I could be digging into deep, deeper stuff. Our God is the God of reconciliation, and he does absolutely incredible and amazing things. If you flip back to the end of 2 Timothy, it's very possible, it's thought to be that 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote right at the end of his life. It is thought that after the end of 2 Timothy, he is, his head was chopped off. That was the end of, the end of, uh, the end of Paul after this. One of the last things he says, he wrote this letter to Timothy. He gave him some final instructions in chapter 4, starting in verse 9. He says to Timothy, Make every effort to come to me soon, because Demas has deserted me, since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Remember that when you were in jail, it wasn't like they gave you three squares a day in cable TV. You had to figure it out on your own, and so you were dependent on your friends to supply the things you need. And so Paul has said, I had some friends with me, but they've left me. A couple of them I sent away to go help in other areas, and so I'm kind of by myself. Verse 11, only Luke is with me, so I still have Luke helping me. And then he says this, Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. That's amazing to me. This John Mark, who had been such a thorn in his side all those years ago, that he would not take him with him on a missionary journey. That John Mark is useless, he might have said. He's useless. He's immature. He doesn't help. He's a hindrance to me. I'm not taking him. Well, it looks like both Paul and John Mark grew up a lot. And now we're 20 years later, and Paul's near the end of his life, and he says, you know who I'd really like to have helping me right now is John Mark. That guy is a, is a big help to me. He's really valuable to me. Can you make sure he comes? That is the reconciliation of God. That doesn't happen because people change. That happens because God changes people. And that's really cool to me. So, at this point, though, they don't have him in verse 14. They continued their journey from Perga and reached Pisidian Antioch. Now, this is not the Antioch where the church is centered. The Antioch that we read about last couple of weeks ago where they were first called Christians in Antioch. There are actually seven cities named Antioch in the region at this time. Uh, that was because of a guy named Antiochus who used to be a ruler. They named these cities after him. This one is in a place called Pisidia, and uh, Antioch uh, was a, a chief city there. This is, if you leave Cyprus from the east end of the island and you sail northeast, uh, you can, there's actually a ferry that you can take. It take it's an eight-hour ferry ride from the edge of Cyprus up there now, but of course at the time they were sailboats. And, and, they, and you sail up there to a port, and then you go up further northeast into uh, the area that's now Turkey, and, uh, and there's uh, this area, Poseidon. It's a long way from where 
Saul was from in Tarsus. My first thought was, well, they went to this region because Saul was from this region. He's from the exact opposite side of the region. It, it's very likely that none of these guys had ever been there before. But they knew there was a community of Jews there. And they felt pretty sure that these Jews had never heard the message of Christ. So this was their targeted area. That's what they went. So they went there. And uh, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. That's going to become Paul's M.O., Remember, he says he is an apostle first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. He always starts with the Jews. He goes into the synagogue. He still has the clothes of a rabbi, of a Pharisee. So he still looks like a traveling teacher. And in those days, it was customary if a traveling Jewish teacher who was approved by the Pharisees, obviously, came into your place and sat down. Then they would, you know, sing a couple of psalms, and then they would read a, a number of sections of Scripture of the Old Testament. And then whoever the leader of the synagogue was would invite either the chief teacher of the synagogue or the traveling teacher that had just shown up would invite them to say something. And sometimes they would even say, can you say something specific about this topic? And that's what happens here. Uh, they went and they sat down, verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. If you want to be uh, talking about something else, if you want to be talking about conviction, if you want to be talking about Sabbath day rules, we're not interested. But if you have something encouraging to say, and Paul said, oh boy, do I have something encouraging to tell you folks. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites, and you who fear God, listen, in other words, all of you, this is for everyone. The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors, made the people pros prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out of it with a mighty arm. He starts with history, history that they all know and can agree to, and history that's very important to them because, of course, they're Jewish people. That's their connection. Remember that, that God chose the Jewish people, that he gave them the promises through Abraham. You remember those promises? Uh, I wrote them down here in uh, Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your land and your relatives and your father's house to the land I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. These were the prob promises that the nation of Israel inherited from God. And they clung to those promises even at this time. Even though they did not have the land. Even though that they did not currently have the blessing in favor of God. And even though they didn't feel like they were being a blessing to all nations. They still clung to the promise that this is what God had told Abraham. And this is where he starts. You remember this. You remember this. You remember that, Israel, that God chose our ancestor, Israel, that he chose, that he chose him. You remember that, that's, that that was the miracle child, Isaac, and the younger one, Jacob. You remember that God chose these people. You remember that, that God chose them and, and that even though they went down to Egypt, God took care of them there. God brought them to Egypt to save them. He brought them to Egypt to prosper them. And they grew from 70 people to a couple of million people over the course of 450 years. You remember this, he says. He might have brought up Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. You know that, well, that the Lord didn't choose them because they were great. Deuteronomy 7 says, The Lord had his heart set on you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. He brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. Paul is saying, we are part of that group. We have inherited that promise. We are within the thousand generations. We have received the promise. You know he said that God made the people prosper in the land of Egypt and led them out with a mighty arm or an outstretched arm that, that God did it for them himself. And you know, verse 18, that for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. I love that term. He put up with them. It can be translated one of two ways and they mean the exact same thing. It either means he nursed them. 
like a nurse, like a, like a mama nurses a baby. He nursed them. Or it means he tolerated their pain in the rearness, which, according to the Hebrew, is the exact same thing. I'm sure the mamas can understand that. He put up with them, hand feeding them for 40 years in the wilderness. And then on their behalf, he destroyed seven nations that were in their way. Talking about the, the exodus, that there were seven nations inhabiting the land that was supposed to belong to them. And the Lord himself destroyed them and drove them out so that he could fulfill his promise. This all took about 450 years. And then he sent them leaders to lead them, to draw them in, to point them to God and to deliver them from their enemies. After this, he gave them judges, the deliverers. Well, you got to understand that these leaders, these judges, you can go back and read the book of Judges. They didn't, most of them do a very effective job. Now, some of them did a really good job, like Caleb and his younger brother. Man, they did a great job. People didn't listen to them. Deborah, she did a wonderful job. People didn't really listen to her. And then they had ones like Samuel, or not Samuel, but uh, Samson, who did a tremendously horrible job. And people didn't listen to him either. They weren't very effective. They weren't effective because the people weren't listening. It wasn't that the, that the judges were, were doing uh, things that God didn't want them to do for the most part. It's just that the people weren't following them. And then came Samuel. Samuel was different. Samuel was not only a leader and a judge. Samuel was a prophet of God. Specifically says in the book of 1 Samuel, God let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, the things that Samuel said held weight. When Samuel said something was going to happen, it happened. When Samuel says, thus saith the Lord, well, it was what the Lord was saying. And the people actually listened to him. Now, they didn't listen very well, and they did a lot of really stupid things, and they got in a lot of trouble, and Samuel had to come and save them again and again. But the people did understand that they weren't measuring up to what God had called them to be. So at the end of Samuel's life, rather than saying, you know, Samuel, we realize we are not measuring up to what God wanted us to be. And so, Samuel, will you instruct us on what we need to do? And will you prepare the next leader and judge so that the next leader and judge can also be a prophet of God, much like Elijah would later prepare Elisha? Would you do that for us, Samuel, so that God will be our king and we will be his people? No, instead they said, we are not measuring up. And so, Samuel, we need a king. We need a king to go out before us and lead us in battle. We need a king. Samuel says, you've already got a king. It's God. They said, no, 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 you don't understand, Samuel. We want a king just like all the other nations have. They, the, people, the people of Israel weren't concerned about not measuring up to God's standards. They were concerned about not being fashionable to the other people in the world. So give us a king. God said, okay. If they want a king, they have rejected me. God told to Samuel, not you. So if you guys want a king, I'll get you a king. They asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. You know, he's a sad story. And, and, and for the sake of time, I'm not really going to get into his story, but he's a sad story. You know, Saul was quite literally head and shoulders above the rest. Not only that, Saul was an incredibly effective leader. He was a really humble guy. And he had all the makings, all the potential of being a great king. But he wasn't. He actually ended up being a pretty poor king. Because Samuel became very selfish. Pardon me, Saul became very selfish. And he did some really selfish and dumb things. Like, for instance, one time the Philistines were attacking. God said, don't worry about it, I've got it. He said, amass the army, go to this place, wait for Samuel. Samuel will get there and lead you in a worship service. After the worship service, you'll be victorious over the Philistines. So Saul got the army together and he went out and he waited. He waited. He waited. He figured Samuel was coming that afternoon, but he didn't. He didn't come that afternoon. He didn't come the next day. He didn't come in two days. He didn't come in three days. And the Philistine army was right over there. And the Israelite army began to mutter, Saul ain't doing nothing. 
Saul's just standing here. We're going to be sitting ducks. Some of the Israelite army went and hid. They became so afraid of the Philistines, they went and hid in caves. Some of the Israelite army said, skip this, I'm going home. And they went home to their own place. And pretty soon there were only about 600 soldiers left and thousands of Philistines. Well, unbeknownst to Saul, that was God's plan. Samuel showed up a week later. Remember the situation with Gideon? How God narrowed that army down from 30,000 to 300? He had done the same thing. The problem is, by the time Samuel showed up to lead him in the worship service, Saul had had enough. He said, I can't wait any longer. The army's deserting me. I'll be the pastor today. And he began to offer sacrifices to God. Well, let me rephrase that. He began to offer sacrifices. He was not seeking to know God. He was not seeking to honor God. He was not seeking to be in good communion with God and to hear from him and to to know what he needed to do in battle because that's how God spoke in services like that. Instead, he just wanted to make sure that the Lord was happy with him so that he could go fight these guys and win. And Samuel came and said, what in the world are you doing? Oh, I'm honoring God. He said, no, you're not. You're not honoring God. Samuel said, you know what? Today was the day that God was going to establish you as king over all Israel. And he was going to make your dynasty, the dynasty that holds Israel together until the end of time. Today was the day. But God has determined that he is looking for a man after his own heart and you aren't it. Later, Saul was told to... uh, Go and wipe out the Amalekites, an enemy of Israel that had existed for a long time. Go and wipe out the Amalekites. Don't leave a single life alive, not animal, not person. Wipe them out. Saul didn't. Well, he went to war and he, would, and he defeated them. But then he brought back the best of the cattle and the sheep. And he brought back one man, the king, Agag. Samuel approaches and says, what is this bleating I hear in my ear? Oh, Samuel says, I have brought for the Lord the best of the cattle and sheep. Samuel says, Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. You didn't obey. And God rejected him as king. And he found a new man to be king, a man named David. Now, David was the least likely. David was not voted most likely to be king when he graduated from high school. He was voted most likely to be a filthy shepherd. He was the least likely candidate. He had red hair, which makes me feel good. But he was, other than that, totally unimpressive. The thing is, David had a heart after God. You've got to understand, David didn't just simply want God's favor. David wanted God. When somebody insulted David's God, they insulted David. That was the only thing he'd stand up for, is if somebody picked on his God. He knew God could handle it, but he wasn't going to let him handle it alone. He'd go fight giants because they said bad things about his God. He was a man after God's heart. He wanted to know God and be with God and be connected to God. And you can see it all over the Psalms. David was was the kind of man that God needed to lead Israel. So after removing Saul, verse 22, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out my will. Saul remind, Paul reminds them. And now he's going to start to make a connection between Samuel and David and between two other people. From this man's descendants, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. Before coming to public attention, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people in Israel. Now, as John was completing his mission, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one. But one is coming after me, and I am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. Paul is making a connection between Samuel and John the Baptist. Samuel, who spoke the words of God and called the people back to God, and John the Baptist, who spoke the words of God and called the people back to God. And Samuel bringing David, pointing out David, saying, this is the man after God's own heart. And John the Baptist pointing out Jesus and saying, this is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He's making that connection for them, introducing them to the concept of Jesus. The history is not, <clears throat> excuse me, the history is not all just a time filler, an introduction. He's tying this together for them so that they can understand it. 
bringing up the prophecies, helping them to see the 456 different individual specific prophecies about the Messiah that only Jesus can fulfill. 26, brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, it is to us that this word of salvation has been sent. We're the ones who, all of us, all of us who fear God, it's to us. We are the ones who are being saved. Is that not a word of encouragement, he says? Since, verse 27, since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers didn't recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. I want to stop and talk about that word recognize for just a minute. Verse 27, since the rulers of the people didn't recognize him, that does not mean that they didn't realize who he was. It means they didn't acknowledge who he was. It's really easy to write a pass for Caiaphas and, and Annas and all those guys and all the synagogue leaders and the Pharisees and say, well, they didn't realize it. They didn't realize Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't realize. They didn't understand the prophecies. They didn't see how it all came together. And so they just missed him. That's not what Saul is saying and he, Paul is saying. He's not giving them a pass. That word recognize that he's got there really means more like, um, like uh, you recognize me as the teacher tonight. It's not like, hey, I've seen that guy before. I think he's the teacher. No, it's that since I'm in this place, you say, oh, okay, it all makes sense. I got here. He's on the stool. He's doing the talking. He's the teacher. You recognize me as the teacher. Some people still don't recognize uh, Joe Biden as the president of the United States. They say, well, that was, a, that was a bad election, and I don't recognize him as president. Well, I don't care. He is installed. He's in that spot. Whether you like it or not, whether he was your first choice vote, or whether you wouldn't have voted for him if he was the only man in the country, that's, it doesn't matter. But you can still say, well, I don't recognize him. Well, see, that's, that's what Saul is saying here, or Paul is saying here. He's saying that the... Um, since the rulers of Jerusalem, verse 27, and their rulers did not, you might say, acknowledge him, accept him, admit who he was. Since they didn't admit that stuff or the sayings of the prophets. Now listen, Paul knew this stuff. He grew up with these guys. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He hung out with the uh, Pharisees. Remember, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? He knew this stuff. He understood the prophecies, and he saw them getting fulfilled in Jesus. And it bothered him, and he didn't know what to do about it, except say, I don't want this man to be ruler over me, so crucify him. That's what he's saying. That, that they refused to acknowledge who Jesus was. So, they have fulfilled the words of the prophets by condemning him to death. You know, I, I think often of what Joseph says at the very end of the book of Genesis. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. The saving is of many lives. You intended it for evil, but God, God had this planned from the beginning. You th now listen, that, that doesn't excuse you, Joseph might say, my brothers, for selling me into slavery. But what it does say is God knew you were going to do that, and he had planned to use that thing for something good. Caiaphas and Annas, you're not excused for condemning Christ because God used that to fulfill prophecy. But God used that to fulfill prophecy. You see, what these people up here in Pisidian Antioch likely had heard about was John the Baptist. Some of them might have come to see him. What they likely had heard about was Jesus, the miracle worker and teacher, the rabbi that traveled around and did this stuff. And what they likely had heard about was that the uh, leaders there in Jerusalem had determined that this man needed to be executed and that they had him crucified. They likely had heard about that. Paul's filling him in. Here's the rest of the story. He's the Messiah. He's the man after God's own heart that we've been waiting for. He's the true son of David, the anointed one that came to give us salvation. Verse 28, though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have them killed. Everybody's like, yeah, you're right. We know about that. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. Now, that's really an interesting point. Boy, I, might, I might mention that on Sunday. We'll see. But the, uh, the Jewish people, if somebody was executed for a crime, they weren't buried in a tomb. They were thrown in a heap of criminals and rotted in kind of a big, nasty mass grave. The Romans, 
if you died on a cross, they left you up there until vultures came and ate you because that's the ultimate disgrace, they figured, to have your body eaten by vultures. But this guy was put in a tomb, this guy Jesus. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead and appeared for many, and he appeared for many days to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. Paul will tell us in the book of 1 Corinthians, that I think it's 1 Corinthians, might have been 2nd, that there were 500 witnesses, some of which had not lived that long, but many of which were still alive. You go check with them. This is a big deal to the Hebrew people. All testimonies established in the mouth of at least two or three witnesses. If two or three witnesses say the same thing, well, then it's true. I heard this analogy this week. Imagine that 7-Eleven got robbed. That, that brand new 7-Eleven downtown down there by the freeway they're building. Imagine that it got robbed. And imagine that after it got robbed, there was a big trial. And a man was on trial for robbing the 7-Eleven. And they called somebody up to the witness stand and they said, did you see it? And he said, yeah, I saw it. He said, I, I saw a guy that looked just like the defendant. He was wearing a blue shirt, black pants. He came in and he pulled a gun and he told the guy behind the counter, give me all your money. And then he got in a little blue Chevy and drove off. I saw it. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Sir, will you come up? And they call the next guy. But another guy comes up and they say, did you see? He said, yeah, I saw it. He says, I was just down there trying to get me a Slurpee. And this guy walks up to the counter wearing black pants and a blue shirt. And he said, right to that cashier, give me all your money. And then he put a gun on him. The cashier gave him the money and he got in a little blue Chevy and drove off. And then they ask a third guy, did you see what happened? And he says, yeah. He says, I was just picking out some candy from the candy aisle. And I see this guy, all I see, I turn and look and black pants and a blue shirt standing there. Looked like maybe he was holding something, probably a gun. And he said to the cashier, give me all your money. And the cashier gave him the money and he got in a blue Chevy and drove off. Now, there's probably a conviction coming, right? Imagine if there were 500 people who all saw this and all testified the same way that this is what happened. 1 Corinthians, thank you. So I was right to begin with. It was, I shouldn't have second guessed myself. Imagine that there were 500 people who all saw the same guy with black pants and blue shirt that looked just like the defendant pulling a gun and asking for the money and getting in the blue Chevy and driving off. Assuming our justice system is working that day, this man's going to be convicted. This is what Paul is saying. We all saw it. We've seen the empty tomb. We've seen the living body. There are 500 people who saw him raised from the dead. doesn't matter what the rulers of the people say. We've got witnesses. The rulers of the people didn't acknowledge him the first time around. You think they're going to acknowledge him now? Verse 32, and we ourselves proclaim to you, here's the encouraging part, the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. What we read about in Genesis chapter 12, it happened. The good news is the promise has happened. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have become your father. By the way, parentheses, what is that today? There are some who really get hung up on the words of John, that Jesus is the only begotten son. They look at it from a real Western perspective of what it means to be a begotten son. That means a biological child of, in the Western mind, the Eastern mind that this was written in certainly didn't mean the same thing. We've talked about that. The son is the exact representation of the father. He is the physical embodiment of the father in the Eastern mind. But there are some who get so hung up on that, and they read this in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I've become your father, and say, look, see, at that moment Jesus was born, and he was born to God. He didn't exist before that. He's just a, a born son. That's not what this means. And as a matter of fact, if you go back into the second psalm and you really look, like, look at that, at what moment is God saying, today I've become your father? Well, it's the moment that he rose from the dead. So then what was Jesus before that? That, that argument just doesn't hold water. And I thought I'd throw that out there because you might have heard it. And by the look, smile on Gary's face, he's heard that one. After raising him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken him in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Now that's, that's really cool. Because in bringing up the concept of decay, he's bringing up the concept of the new life. He's mentioned that Jesus is about to be the ultimate deliverer, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise. And then he says, what does this mean to you? It means new life. Because you see, every one of us, Paul might say, is heading for decay. Maybe he'll use my line. 
and he'll say, I've checked the latest stats on the death rate, and it still hovers right around 100%. All of us are going to die, and every one of us is going to rot in the ground. That's just what we're all looking at. Paul might have pointed at some of the old people there and said, looks like you already started. Well, I guess if he wanted to make a joke and have enemies. But anyway, he might have pointed out to them what they all know, that everybody is heading for the same end, except Jesus, the ultimate deliverer. He's here to give new life through the holy and sure promises of David that we can go read about in the Psalms if we have time. Therefore, he also said in another passage, verse 35, you will not let your holy one see decay. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and decayed. Same thing happened to him that happened to everybody else. The wages of sin is death. He died and rotted. That happened to everybody since Eve bit that apple. Or whatever kind of fruit it was. But the one God raised up did not decay. He has a whole new kind of life. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. What is the new kind of life? Forgiveness of sins. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. We're going to talk about this on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, that through him we have forgiveness of sins and justification. Remember what Paul says about the law. The law is the schoolmaster, he says. Remember, he says uh, in Romans 7, 7, I wouldn't have ever known what sin was if it wasn't for the law. Imagine that there was no speed limit in the city of Mount Vernon. You could go as fast as you want. My 16-year-old son is saying, all right, let's do it. You could go as fast as you want in the city of Mount Vernon. But it's dangerous. And you don't know what that, that point of safety is. You don't know at, at which point you're, you're, you're going too fast. Because you just go as fast as you want. But then they passed a law. They said the, same, the speed limit on 1st Street is 25 miles an hour. Well, all of a sudden, we know when we're going too fast, don't we? All of a sudden, we know that 30 miles an hour is too fast. I'm breaking the law. Well, I, maybe most of the people on 1st Street don't know that, so maybe we should tell them. But still, the, the law lets us know at which point we're stepping across the line. That's the purpose of the law. The Hebrew people were convinced that by keeping the law, they would be saved. Paul is making the point, by keeping the law, you're not going to be saved. By keeping the law, you're just not going to get in worse trouble. No, no, you can't get saved that way because you can't be justified by keeping the law. You can only be justified if you can go back to beginning and wipe all of the law breaking away, and the law doesn't do that. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. That's encouraging for these people in the synagogue. So beware that what is said in the prophets doesn't happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away, because I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone explains it to you. This is his altar call. Imagine if I said that on Sunday morning. Now listen, you scoffers. I told you the truth. Now listen, don't you dare get up and walk away without, without listening to what I said. You know, honestly, there are times I feel this way. I got to admit, there are times that I finish a service and it's been a good service and people have worshiped and the spirit of God is here and the word of God is, is powerful and people are being affected and I see tears in their eyes and we get to the end of the service and the songs are all done and a whole bunch of people just kind of stand up and mill about and shake hands and talk about what restaurant they're going to go to or what game they're going to watch when they get home. And I'm like, people, didn't you hear the voice of God calling you? Well, this is what Paul's saying. Look, he is doing something fantastic, something amazing. Don't be like the people that Habakkuk was talking to. You wouldn't believe it even if I explained it to you. Don't be that way, he says. Well, verse 42. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. The people that were there said, gosh, I think he's right. I think he's right on. Oh, man, I want to know more about this. Paul, can you, can you come back to church next week? Can you tell us again next week? Sure, you bet. I'd love to, I'd love to open more scripture and, and tell you how it comes together. But look at this, verse 43. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism, those are Gentiles, followed Paul and Barnabas 
I guess Paul and Barnabas were going out to eat and they went with them. Who were speaking with them, I love this line, and urging them to continue in the grace of God. Not urging them to continue in the law. Not urging them to continue in the study of the scripture so that you might figure out how to please God. Not urging them to, to follow all of the missionas and all of the rules and make sure you don't break the Sabbath day rule this week. They urge them to continue in the grace of God. We might say the provenient grace, the grace that goes before and draws them to him. When I was a kid, I learned that grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Continue in the riches of God that were made available to you by the sacrifice of Christ. You guys are getting a good start, Paul and Barnabas said. You're understanding, you're figuring it out. You're connecting in. This is good. He says, now keep it up. Keep it up. Continue seeking after Christ. Well, the following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Man, the news spread, didn't it? I wonder if we could get some news to spread between Wednesday and Sunday. The news spread and, and a whole town showed up, verse 45. But when the Jews, uh, parentheses, whenever Luke says the Jews, he means the Jewish leaders. When the Jews, that's the Jewish leaders, saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. I did a little work on that word jealousy. I thought it would be the word envy, but it's not. It really is more the word indignation. They were indignant at Paul. They weren't so much envious of him. See, I thought, well, Paul is drawing big crowds and they wish they were being drawing big crowds. No, they were more indignant. Who does this guy think he is? This new guy showing up into town, talking about all this new stuff. Who does he think he is? We don't appreciate the new guy coming in and making these changes. We don't appreciate him setting aside the teachings for these new teachings, which he wasn't doing. He was trying to encourage them with the completion of the teaching. But they were indignant, and they began to contradict what Paul was saying. So that doesn't mean they were effectively saying you're wrong. It means they were arguing with him. And then they begin to insult him. Remember that if somebody is arguing with you and they can't make a good point, the first thing they go to is insults, and the next thing they go to is violence. Well, they begin to insult him. They would say, well, yeah, but you're wrong about what it says about Jesus. And he says, well, actually, if you look in the Old Testament, it says this and that. And they say, well, you're a poopy head then. And that's what they were getting to. Well, Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Since you reject it, I love this, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. We are turning, that's a sting right there. We are turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. And they quote even more scripture. I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord. That word for honored is glorified, doxa. They glorified the word of the Lord. They lifted it up. They praised God. They said, this is amazing what God has done. So amazing that he would include us. That's a really good feeling. Sometimes when we're here having a prayer meeting, I'm just like, wow, God included me in this? That's what they were feeling. They have, they, God has included us. They, they, they glorified the word of the Lord. They followed the word of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, our friends who are um, very much into predestination teaching tell us that this means that, you, that some of them just didn't have a choice. They were appointed. Those who were going to go to heaven went to heaven, and those who were going to go to hell went to hell, and that's the end of it. They were appointed. All who were appointed, they, they, they believe. Well, um, except that we're about to see that there were others who had a choice to reject. If you've got a choice to reject, then you must have to have a choice to accept. Yeah, they were appointed to eternal life. But I'm wondering if they were appointed to eternal life through provenient grace, the grace that went before, got them ready. They heard the word and received it. And in that receiving, they were appointed. I guess my point is God's bigger than us. And somehow he can figure out how to make sure that men choose and that he knows which men are going to choose and is prepared for them. So all that were appointed to eternal life believed. I talk about that more, but I'm out of time and my wife's going to shut me off in a minute. 
Um, 50, but the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas because if insults don't work, you go to violence and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. That concept of shaking the dust off their feet, this actually began with Jews who would go into Gentile territories. And they said, even the dust in this territory is filled with unclean Gentileness. And so we're going to we're going to get rid of it so that we don't carry this uncleanness around. And then Jesus, of course, told the teachers, if you go into a town or to a home and they don't receive the teaching, you do that. You say, I, I don't want the uncleanness of your lot listening to me on me. It's just a symbol of, of saying, I've done everything I can do. I'm, I'm not taking the uncleanness of your actions with me. So they did that. They said, you guys are left to your own devices. But, verse 52 the disciples that were there were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. They had been encouraged and the new church had started and it's absolutely fantastic. We'll see them go back to that church later. Um, but a great example of a fantastic sermon. I'm thinking about just reading it word for word Easter Sunday morning. And then especially we get to the part about uh, the part about, uh, you know, making sure you don't walk away even if you think you can't believe it. But maybe I won't. I'll get back to opening Blue Letter Bible and some Bible software and grab my pencil and my commentaries and keep on working at it. And so you should be here Saturday night at 6 o'clock or Sunday morning at 10 o'clock uh, for the Easter resurrection service. It's going to be fantastic. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you have led us to and what you have done. We thank you that you have brought us good news. We thank you that Stephen's sermon was effective, that people listened, that Saul was transformed that Paul preached and people heard and disciples were filled with joy. And we pray, O oh Lord, that the same would happen right here in this church building this weekend. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good night.